and welcome to the debrief from the business of fashion, where each week we go deep on our most popular BOF professional stories with the correspondents who created them. I'm Lauren Sherman. Selling quote unquote direct to consumer is not a new concept. For years, specialty retailers in the US like Victoria's Secret, Abercrombie & Fitch, and L.L. Bean have sold their own products through their own stores rather than going through a third party. But over the last decade, a crop of venture capital-backed startups took the concept online, billing it as a revolutionary way to sell. By cutting out the middleman, in this case, the multi-brand retailer, online DTC players could charge consumers less for products while still offering them top quality. It worked until it didn't. As more brands tapped the online channel, the cost of acquiring customers increased and made it even harder to achieve profitability. Then came the DTC bust with many brands closing and others losing significant traction. But when it comes down to it, selling direct still makes sense. It's what these brands are doing behind the scenes that's changing. Today I have with me BOF Deputy Editor Ryan Baskin and Retail Correspondent Kathleen Chen to talk about what went wrong and what's next. Brian and Kat, thank you so much for being here. And Brian, this is your first time on The Debrief. It is. Thank you for having me. So happy to have you both. Let's talk about what the direct-to-consumer market means in 2022 and what challenges it's faced in the past couple of years. All right. So... um why don't I try to sum up a decade of fashion history in like a minute here? When we talk about direct to consumer, we're not really talking about Gap or Victoria's Secret, even though they meet the technical definition of selling products directly to customers without a middleman. What we mean is this big group of new brands that started appearing around 10 years ago with the eyewear brand Warby Parker and a couple others. And some of them sold makeup and some sold clothes or suitcases or mattresses, but they basically all followed this very similar model, which at the time meant you could typically only get that product through the brand's website rather than say a department store, which is the direct part. And then the second part of this formula was that they were selling something that looked like a premium product at a relatively affordable price, which they said they could do because they'd cut out the middleman and all the costs involved with that. And consumers loved this and these products are branded in this very sleek way and they felt very new. And so you saw brands like Allbirds with their sneakers and Glossier makeup growing just astonishingly quickly when investors were giving them just hundreds of millions of dollars and they valued these brands in the billions of dollars, which was basically a bet that Glossier really was going to be the next Estee Lauder and Allbirds was going to be the next Nike and Everly in the new Gap. And that all played out great, just as expected until the pandemic. And a lot of these companies started to go public and have their exits and these big deals. And that future seemed to be coming true and everyone's shopping online and everything's going great. And the pandemic then also exposed this big flaw in the model, which is that nobody in all this time had actually figured out how to make money off of selling products directly to customers without the middleman. And over the last year or so, investors are looking around and saying, wait a minute, you told us you'd get big enough and the profits would come. Where are the profits? And I think consumers have also looked around and said, OK, like I got my Allbirds sneakers. What else you got for me? And I don't know that a lot of these companies have come up with an answer for that. So where we are now is the companies that have gone public have seen their valuations fall by as much as 90 percent from their highs. And there's similar activity happening in the private markets. And there's a real question about whether these new companies have a future as independent brands and retailers. Kat, what are you seeing in terms of are people still using this model? If they are, how does it look different than it did a few years ago? This reckoning, as we've called it before, really began before the pandemic when there was a lot of fatigue among investors to be funding fundamentally unprofitable businesses. And then in a strange way, when the pandemic happened and so much of commerce moved online, there was this renaissance of direct-to-consumer brands and, and the direct-to-consumer business doing really, really, really well. And I just feel like I have whiplash covering this industry sometimes because before the pandemic, investors were unhappy with profit margins. During the pandemic, it was like, okay, it doesn't matter. Anything digital, anything direct, that is the way of the future and consumers are behaving that way. And now the public markets 
super volatile, not doing well. There's a lot of uncertainties in the macroeconomic environment, inflation, the war. All of a sudden, there's this 180 reversal among investors, again, to be extremely skeptical of direct-to-consumer. Not because they're renouncing the model all over again, but I think investors today are just skeptical of anything that that's not profitable right now. Even technology companies, even SaaS or software as a service companies, not product, not direct-to-consumer, even these startups are feeling the heat from their investors. Their valuations have gone down. And so right now in the private market, there's very little appetite for any business model that isn't lucrative, that operates in the red. In the public market, we have seen since Casper, the mattress company, since Casper's IPO, that there is very little appetite and there's very little tolerance for unprofitable product companies. And now we're seeing that with Allbirds and Warby Parker. And there's just been mounting evidence since, you know, 2018, 2019, that no investor wants to invest in an unprofitable business. That is the intrinsic problem with the direct-to-consumer industry right now. The thing is, if you do this slowly and carefully, it can be a profitable business. And actually, a brand takes a long time to grow. And the problem is, from my perspective, that these companies have been given a lot of money to grow more quickly than they should as a product company or a consumer product company. And therefore, the model is screwed up. But it can work. Brian, you did a piece last week, a preview of all the earnings of a lot of these companies, the public ones at least. And what is working generally? I think it's less about how long it takes you to grow and more about how you grow. There are some companies that have grown incredibly quickly, like On, which makes running shoes, or Olaplex, which is one of the ones I wrote about last week, which sells high-end hair care products. And they are newer than a lot of these companies we've been talking about. And they are enormous and their valuations are bigger than all these companies combined practically, the ones that have gone public anyway. But the way that they grew is kind of boring. They did wholesale deals. They got famous people to talk about them and endorse them. They just did stuff the old fashioned way. And that makes them a little less exciting. They're not necessarily disrupting anything, but it's been quite successful and it's proven a lot easier to be profitable embracing the middleman rather than cutting them out in a lot of cases. Can we talk really briefly about Warby Parker at what their earnings looked like last week? Because I know it, it hasn't been an easy ride for them on the market. They developed a loyal following online. They disrupted a model in that they made trying on glasses at home or buying glasses on the internet easier. Then they opened a ton of stores, which you have to do for a product like that. For years, people would be like, we're the Warby Parker of X. And then it was the Glossier of X or whatever, but they were really the pioneer in this market. I think there's two elements there. One is the market they chose and, and their approach, which was genuinely disruptive. I mean, eyewear was dominated basically by one or two huge, very old fashioned, very slow moving companies. And so what Warby Parker brought to that market was genuinely new and people responded to that. And I think that there's a base for long term success there that they can build on and they probably have a little more runway than a brand trying to release just a new product in a sea of many products. And then the other element are the stores that they've been opening, which is what a lot of these D2C brands are pivoting to. They're saying, okay, we've done the online thing. We've maximized our returns there. We need to get out there in the real world where people are really shopping so we don't have to just spend all our money on Instagram ads. But it's a bit of a misconception that Warby Parker is now a major physical retailer. I think there's something like a couple hundred Warby Parker stores. There must be 10,000 stores owned by um, the biggest eyewear seller. I mean, they're a minnow in that physical market, and they haven't really proven that they're a physical retailer just yet, but they could. Yeah, I agree with that part of why they're losing so much money right now is because rising costs and so many businesses are dealing with this. But I do think that looking at something like shipping, the cost of which is just so dramatically gone up in the past couple of years. Once Warby Parker has these stores up and running, 
they're opening nearly 200 new stores this year or something like that. Once they have these retail locations up and running and the stores become profitable, I think they will see their losses lighten up a little bit and they're going to have economies of scale through retail. To answer your question earlier about what direct-to-consumer looks like today versus what it did a decade ago, I would say that all of the distribution channels that they were turned off by wholesale and retail, they're embracing today. I think that is the major difference. We're seeing Allbirds and Warby open a ton of stores. We're seeing Glossier in Sephora. And these are developments that we really wouldn't have seen even three, four years ago that we're seeing today. I'm going to push back a little, though. I don't think a couple hundred stores, even a thousand stores is necessarily a ton of stores in the market that they're operating in. I mean, I was looking it up just now, Essilor Luxottica, which is the giant in eyewear, has 11,000 stores. Nike alone, just in its own brand stores, has a thousand stores and who knows how many wholesale distribution points. And, And these DTC brands haven't come anywhere near competing on that level and they almost certainly don't have the money to reach that scale. It's a really good point, Brian. I do think one thing to think about in this market is where they're getting the capital to open these stores, which is what you all have said. It's very expensive. Think about Old Navy. It was a billion dollar brand in four years, I think. It was the fastest growing brand at that time, but it had Gap Inc., which was already a billion dollar brand to accelerate that growth and had the real estate, had the leases had the 10 year leases you could swipe in and out. They had the capital because they had a big company backing them. If you think about something like Madewell and J. Crew, same thing. More recently, Gap with Athleta. The success of Athleta is amazing, but it's also because they just used a bunch of old Gap stores and plopped it in there. So to ramp up distribution that quickly, you need some sort of capital or backup. And the difference between and all birds and on running is an interesting example and they've leaned very heavily on wholesale but a gap a victoria's secret these companies never had to do wholesale because of the fact that they either grew slowly or by the time that they were ramping up expansion they had enough capital and real estate deals and all that stuff everything comes back to real estate in this life but it's a great point brian and i think there's a lot to mine on warby also in terms of how much they need to develop the brand further because you go into a sunglass hut or whatever, even though all that stuff is exactly the same, it has 50, 100 different brands on it. So it makes it feel more variety. And I think that's another thing. Kat, you just wrote a piece on this brand Air. Can you talk a bit about what it is and how they've approached this market? So AIR, which stands for all year round, is a women's wear brand, pretty much wholly direct to consumer. So 97% of their sales happens through their own e-commerce site. It's a brand that was founded in 2014 as a subsidiary under Bonobos. So Bonobos' founder, Andy Dunn, had met with soon-to-be founder of AIR, Maggie Winter, at the time, she was a merchandiser at J. Crew, and they met. She talked about her vision for a brand that would sell only the basics, so jeans and tops, and that was sort of the premise of the brand. Within two years, Bonobos shut air down. Bonobos itself was trying to be profitable. This was right before they were sold to Walmart. And then Air had to strike out on its own. So the co-founders, Maggie and Max Bonbrest, they very quickly raised some money, friends and family, and migrated the platform onto their own and started their trajectory as a totally independent company. And they've mostly used digital marketing, so social media ads, until in 2020, they started doing catalogs. And today it's a mix of catalogs and Instagram ads and our digital marketing. And they've seen tremendous success. They broke even in 2020 and they were EBITDA positive last year. And this year they're on track to hit $60 million in sales. And that's up from, I think, single digits in 2019, 2020. 
and they haven't raised a lot of money. They raised a friends and family and then a small round in, I think it was 2019, but they've had less than $6 million in funding so far. And now because they're profitable, they don't need to raise more money. So Brian, you edited this piece, correct? That's correct. What was your insights from seeing what they're doing? I think the main insight for me was that it is in fact possible to launch a brand and not take a giant truckload of money from SoftBank or or one of these VC investors. But at the same time, I think it's a nice story, but this brand is also, it doesn't seem like it's on track to become the next Gap or or J. Crew or whoever we're talking about. And maybe that's not these founders' aspirations, but there's plenty of people out there who when they launch a brand, they want to become a really, really big brand that everyone's wearing and influence the culture. And I think that's the mentality behind a lot of these other brands. And in a way, it's almost apples and oranges in that case. Well, it's also what is the motivation? What is their end game? Are they passionate about fashion? They actually do seem like they are. But what is the end goal? If you've only raised six million bucks, you have less pressure from investors. So as Kat, as you said, they don't need to raise more money. They could keep going. And 10 years from now, they could be a $500 million business and actually even more quickly than that. And maybe they could sell to private equity if they want to cash out. I think one interesting thing about this generation of founders is they aren't all that interested in being merchants or being involved in the fashion industry or retail. They don't like love retail. It's just that they thought this was a good business and they want out in 10 years and they want to make money. They're more entrepreneurs than they are retail people. It seems like Air is leaning on the side of they really do love this and want to do this for their life's work. But it seems like generally it's been more about what's the exit strategy for a lot of these companies and less about the endurance of the brand itself. I think the approach among different founders make the biggest difference in how well their businesses will fare, you know, five years, 10 years down the road. I see two different types of founders or two different types of DTC startups. There's on one hand, the sort of very, very well-known, the first generation, a lot of media hype. I'm talking about Allbirds, Warby, Glossier, Everlane, Reformation, created a lot of buzz, raised a lot of money. On the other hand, there are sort of smaller to medium-sized direct-to-consumer companies that were founded around the same time, but never appeared in media the way that these other brands have. And so I'm thinking of like a Buck Mason. I would say Air falls in this category where it's a brand that not everybody knows. They do, you know, 50 to $200 million in sales, maybe a little bit more. I remember I wrote about this company called Thursday Boots Company once, and they never had any VC money. They got a private equity investment a few years ago, but they do nine digit sales. And there are all these brands that do really, really well that you just don't ever hear about. And I think the difference is just in how aggressive the founders pursue growth and fame. And what we've learned is that there is an arrogance sometimes to how they approach that business and, and an arrogance in expecting sales to triple, quadruple, grow tenfold every year. I don't think it's an arrogance. I think they're doing what the market is suggesting and they want to make money. And I do think marketing your strategy was a big part of the last 10 years of every business. And it was also a big part of DTC. So a lot of those companies now are being picked apart because they used their strategy as marketing and it's more challenging to them. To me, it really is about what the overall economy and what entrepreneurship and brand building and business building in the U.S. look like for the last 15 years. Think about Facebook and Meta and all that stuff too. It's just that it doesn't work in product. And so they're all suffering now. The one thing that we haven't talked about, Lauren, in this conversation at all is product. I think if you look at whether consumers really like some of these products and 
how often they actually go back and purchase again. It's not as rosy as I think the industry thought it would be. And I think the one observation I've made with consumers today is that they are vocal about when a product isn't good. And they've heard of all these direct-to-consumer brands from Instagram, from their friends, from the media, and they try it out. And if it's not good, it's almost going to hurt these brands more that they've created so much hype around themselves. It is true that a lot of them deprioritize product. And I think now they're starting to get that. One company we haven't talked about is Skims. And Alex and I did a whole podcast about that. Imran did a podcast with Jens, who's the CEO, but they are a business that's EBITDA positive. I think they're going to do 450 million or ship $450 million worth of goods this year or something around that number. Brian, what do you think about them? And what is the sort of future of this market? Where do you see the brands going, the successful ones at least? Skims is kind of a throwback almost for as modern a product as it is. They basically found a market where there was room for a cool new brand. They released a product people like, and they have the biggest celebrity in the world talk about it constantly. And there's probably companies that were doing that in 1975. And they've got lots of modern tricks that they've in part borrowed from all the DTC brands that came before them. But I don't think what they're doing is necessarily revolutionary. It's just very well executed. And that's honestly a great model for other brands that are going to come later. And I got the sense, especially from the interview that we ran a couple months ago with Jens and with Kim Kardashian, that they will sell direct when it suits them and they will sign a big wholesale deal when that suits them and their eye is on the prize, which is profitable growth at a fast pace to justify this valuation they have. But the key there is profitable growth and nobody's losing sleep about you know whether it's direct or they're a wholesale company or what the model is necessarily. In terms of where things are headed next, I think short term, we're going to keep seeing headlines about layoffs and brands closing their sub brands and their experiments that they launched when times were better. I mean, like, did Allbirds really need to be selling leggings? Probably not. Reining in some of those excesses. And we're going to see more founders stepping down because it's fun to build a brand when you're growing and it's less fun to spend all your time optimizing margins on e-commerce returns and all the grim realities of the fashion industry. And then we'll see who sinks and who swims. I haven't seen a forecast that we're going to see this wave of brands going bankrupt or getting sold and picked apart by licensing companies or anything. But we saw reports late last week that Outdoor Voices was considering a sale. I don't think they'll be the last brand to be looking for their next chapter. Kat, do you have anything to add to this illuminating conversation? I think the norm of not caring about how much money you have right now to sustain the business for six months, for 12 months, in this world, it's known as your runway. How far can you survive without extra cash coming in? The norm in the past decade has just been like, who cares? We're just going to grow, grow, grow. And every year we're going to raise another round. And I think that has ended. I mean, we'll see. Once the economy gets better, it's going to start all over again. Exactly. We've seen it happen up and down, up and down the last three years. It's like, stop. No one has any money. Then suddenly things pick up and everyone's like, woohoo. It's just Americans love to spend money. (laughs) I think this will happen is that the savviest, the most prudent entrepreneurs and investors will see what's happening now and have it informed their future decisions. And I also think that the DTC giants, I think that many of them will become what they want to become. In 10 years, I'm sure that Warby Parker will have so much greater share in eyeglasses as they expand in in retail. I mean, this is a brand that they have so much awareness because of the money that they've spent on buying that awareness. And it's just a matter of what they do with it. But we'll see, the money is still there. Like investors are really, really well capitalized right now. And so I think that there will be new direct-to-consumer brands, new e-commerce brands that take some of that original playbook. Still, there'll be a third, fourth generation of DTC startups. 
and investors will want to discover those brands. But at the same time, I do think that the approach will be different. The approach will be a little bit more measured. Got it. Well, Kat, thank you as always for joining me. I'm sure we'll be discussing this again very soon. And Brian, it was so nice to have you. I hope you come back soon. This was great. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks both. You've been listening to The Debrief, produced and edited by the one and only Emma Clark, Kate Barton, and Eric Bria in the BOF studio. I'm Lauren Sherman, and I'll be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks so much for joining us, and be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. You can join BOF Professional today with an exclusive 25% discount on an annual membership covering key industry topics from sustainability to technology to marketing with access to our case studies, live events, and iOS app. To get this special offer and benefit from 25% off of a membership, head to the link in the episode show notes or enter the coupon code DEBRIEF at checkout. Visit businessoffashion.com slash memberships. Thank you.